Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Centre for Educational Neuroscience seminar series. My name is Spencer Hayes, and I'm one of the members of uh, the research team. I'm uh, delighted to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Nathan Foster, um, to deliver a talk this afternoon. So since uh, 2018, Nathan has been a, a researcher on the Minded Project at the Italian Institute of Technology in Geneva. The programme aims to advance the diagnosis, imaging and treatment of developmental disorders by the integration of nanomedicine, molecular neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience robotics. His particular research focus is investigating how processes associated with sensory motor integration uh, help to modulate sensory motor learning and control. Uh, with the goal to develop and establish new diagnostic and therapeutic sensory motor approaches to autism and other developmental disorders. Uh, the Minded project uh, was funded by the European Horizon 2020 scheme um, under the Marie Curie Grant Agreement number 754490. Um, thank you, Nathan. I will hand over to you and uh, thanks very much for your time. Great. Thanks a lot, Spencer. Um, so Spencer, my seven name's Nathan Foster. So um, I work at IIT in Italy, where we're a, a large multidisciplinary um, group where our institution spans single cell work all the way to um, work in like in applied environments such as education, neurodevelopmental disorders, as Spencer said, as well as robotics. And um, I'm going to give a talk to you today on my the body of work I've been doing in my recent work, where we've been looking at um, how we can modulate practice structure to facilitate motor learning and transfer in autism. Um, so first of all, I think the important thing to ask is why motor? So as I'm sure you all know, autism is traditionally referred to as a disruption of social communication, social interaction, and where the individuals experience repetitive and repeated behaviors sometimes self-injurious behaviors or like rocking, for example. And motor, traditionally, the motor component has kind of gone under the radar. And although it isn't actually part of the formal diagnostic criteria for DSM-5, um, in recent times and the continuing research going on has shown that motor is, could be a fundamental aspect, motor problems could be a fundamental aspect of autism and not only in terms of just motor control, motor learning, but also the knock-on effects and associated effects that link to um, problems in social interaction and social communication. Um, so as I said, like motor is fundamental. It's fundamental, just to assume you can all see my cursor. Um, well, hopefully yes. you can. Cool. Yeah, you can yeah. um, so as I said, like motor is fundamental. Like it's how we navigate our way around the world. We develop our motor behavior and improve our, our skills throughout our lifespan. We use it to perform mundane daily day tasks that we take for granted, such as dressing ourselves, um, navigating our rooms, as well as for interaction. Um, not only do we signal and perform communicative gestures, behaviors, arm sig hand signals, but also we, we show our intentions, we communicate, et cetera, through our motor system. And it's understanding these processes and what's going on is how we hope to better understand autism. And it's been suggested as well in more recent times that maybe autism could be seen under the lens of dysfunction of the nervous, the central nervous system rather than as a social problem. And that maybe this is motor could be the, the parachute that we can investigate all these aspects together. And this is also important in terms of intervention and intervention design is st I've started to incorporate more motor aspects and specifically an area that is linked to my background. So I come from a sports science background originally is where we've seen recent interventions increasing looking at physical activity. And so having these taking part in physical to active group sessions. So there's been recent work on soccer, um, as well as other sports, trampolining, for example. And they've been shown not only to have health benefits in terms of just being more active, so the health benefits, but also 
social benefits. So engaging in these kind of group sessions, peer-to-peer -peer learning opportunities in these group-based physical activity interventions have been shown to be really beneficial. Um, but of course, there are always barriers to entry and participation in these tasks. And regardless of whether you're on the autism spectrum or not, I think we've all had experiences of when we, if we've participated in sporting activity or any kind of physical activity, where a barrier to entry that can either be whether it's a meaningful barrier that you, you're not able to perform or participate or a like a more psychosocial problem that you it's a it's demotivating can be just our motor skill our motor ability for example this recent study on basketball um, where they looked at specifically training shooting skills so that the children's skill level was better before they entered a more a group session of mixed ability group sessions so that they weren't demotivated and so that they felt they could be involved and included from the up from the word go as it were so our motor abilities as well as being beneficial to these social gains is we this our fundamental motor skill can be a barrier in of itself um, so one way we can look at this is through studying motor learning and control so this is a very basic model of motor control, um, but this is kind of the fundamental principles of what guides the research um, I'm going to take you through today. So what we have here is a multi-stage process when we perform an action. So we just take the example, a simple action of reaching to press a light switch. So the first thing we do, we have to engage our sensory systems. This is vision. This is our proprioception, our physical understanding of our body, and also of so not only of our own body and our motor system, but also of our environment and the goal of our action. So if I want to press a light switch, not only do I need to know where my limb is in space, how long my limb is, but I need to know the size of the light switch, how far away that light switch is. I need to have an idea of the amount of force I need to produce to depress the switch itself. And what we do is we, we engage our sensory systems, we extract this information from our environment and from ourselves, and we form a state estimate. So this is our, our picture, as it were, of what the situation we're in is, what we need to do. And we can then take that information and use it under the, um, the lens of the desired goal we want to achieve. So for example, pressing the light switch, and we can use that to form a motor plan. So this is going to be the instructions of what we need to do to perform the task, how, far, how much force we need to produce, how far we need to travel. And then we use those instructions, that motor plan to generate a motor command. So through the nervous system, and then we do two things with that motor command. First of all, well, in simultaneously, we use it as to produce a, what we call a forward model. So this is our, if I use like an, uh, like an educational term, this is the mark scheme. This is how we're going to grade how well we're performing the action. So this is our predicted consequences of our movement. This is what we expect we will do. And then we also use that command to execute the action itself. And then what we are very good at doing and what we do is online, we can then make comparisons between what we expected to do and what we actually do to make corrections. So if we decide, if we're reaching for the light switch and it's further away than we thought, we can then re-engage our sensory systems to make these comparisons, re-evaluate our state and make corrections to, like, to reach further, to not reach as far, to slow down. And we can do this online during actions in this, in this kind of closed loop feedback system to refine our actions. And then if over repetitions, over trial to trial, in, in terms of learning, we can repeat this process. We can take, we can use what we found out the first time we did it to help generate this motor plan. So, cause we now have pr previous experience and knowledge and we can then use that to use our previous experience to plan it when we do it next time and so on. So over trials, our performance gets better, we can become more accurate and 
This is like the basic concept of motor learning. So trial to trial, we consolidate our experiences and the feedback, and we use that to repeat actions. But what about in autism? So as I said, and we know from the literature that there are tend to be issues in fine and gross motor control in autism. These have been shown. And so does this learning occur in the same way? And this is one of the studies, the first study I want to go through today is the basis of this. Um, in no way is this the only study to show this or the first, but it would show is does do these processes occur as we would expect? So this is a very simple lab-based task that we used. So participants sat at a desk a monitor in front of them and then on the desk in front of them was a graphics tablet where they controlled a stylus and then with that stylus they performed a very simple three segment movement sequence so they had to move the stylus from a home position to a middle target back to the home position and then through that home position from the home position through the middle target to an end target and the task was to perform this with a criterion movement time of 1700 milliseconds. And then following each trial, we provided the participants feedback of whether they would, how fast or slow they were in comparison to that goal time. And then they repeated this over trials. So participants completed 30 trials of practice followed by a retention test. So when we're looking at motor learning, and this will come up again, so I'll explain it now, is not only do we necessarily look at change over practice, but we also look at retention or transfer as well. And what these concepts are, are looking to assess learning. So when, we, when I talk about retention test, um, these, can come up, these will come under two conditions here throughout this talk. So firstly, a, a retention test will look at the exact skill they just, they, that was practiced but we remove the feedback. So they then practice this task, but without feedback in regards to the time, or there may be a time delay. So you could, you can look at multiple retention tests. So you could look at it 10 minutes after practice, an hour after practice, a day after practice and so on. And also transfer tasks where you then see how practicing one task affects performance on another task, okay. So what we did was 30 trials of practice followed by retention without feedback. And this study was with autistic adults. So we had 26 autistic adults and 26 um, neurotypical controls, which were all matched on age, gender, and IQ. And importantly, what we found was both the autistic and neurotypical participants did learn. So the dependent variable we're using here on the y-axis is total error. So this is a combination measure of their accuracy and variability with regards to that target movement time of 1700 milliseconds. So zero error would, would be they perfectly performing 1700. And as the error goes up, it shows how much slower they were. It would be possible to have a negative score where you're going too fast, but in this case, that didn't happen. And what we see importantly for both groups is they both adapted their behavior over time and became more accurate at producing that goal movement time. And in retention, when we took feedback, this performance was maintained. So the big important thing here is, yes, there were some slight decreases for both groups if we look across, but the performance here is still far more significantly more accurate than it was here. So this is really important at a basic level because what it shows, and as I said, this is not the, we're not the first people to show this at all, but it shows that autistic individuals do learn. That process I explained before where from trial to trial, you engage in this continuous process where you update and refine action models is occurring and it's occurring similarly to their neurotypical counterparts but that doesn't mean there are no differences in their motor execution. So I just want to highlight a very specific variable that we used in this study, and that is spatial variability at peak acceleration. So when you think about this as a movement across in space, this is the physical location of the, of the, um, of the, of the limb when they've reached peak acceleration in each of the three segments. 
So this is if you say, for example, if you look at, think of like a, in terms of spatial variability, if you think of a dartboard, if you're throwing for a bullseye and you hit the bullseye every time, your variability, your spatial variability is very low. But if you hit all across the board, you're, you're in, in, in that 2D space, it's more variable. So this is what we're looking at is the physical position of the limb. And what we found was autistic individuals were more variable at this kinematic landmark. So this replicates previous work, including that of um, Cheryl Glazebrook, who I know um, gave a great talk last week to you all. Um, but importantly, so that, that is indicative of a motor difference so in autism. But what's very important, and this is really shown in our segment two finding here, is that variability decreased, decreased over practice. During acquisition, their variability was reduced. And this is a also another signal of learning is reduction in variability. So whilst there are there is a clear difference between the autistic and neurotypical participants in this variable, in terms of spatial variability at peak acceleration, learning is still occurring and they're still improving at this. But what this marker actually means, and if related to this, um, another movement of model of motor control by um, Dick Bielitz. This is the multi-process model of um, goal-directed actions. So we use this as a established model, which we use to describe aiming movements, reach to grass movements. And so when we look at this idea of this, we're looking at this marker at peak acceleration, what this is indicative of, and we suggest is that variability here is indicative of problems in the specification and magnitude of magnitude and timing of muscular forces and the formation of the of that forward model um, that was in the previous model. So it's problems in the planning pro stage of the movement seem to be a, a motor difference in autism compared to their neurotypical counterparts. So if we know this and we can examine this, and this has been shown several times, if we know motor planning and these feed forward phases of motor control are a problem in autism, we can plan our studies, we can plan experiments, and we can plan our interventions, design our interventions to accommodate for these problems. What we can do is create task structures that facilitate motor planning to help these these individuals overcome this problem so it's not it's again if we take the um the idea of interventions but taking it to this scale it's removing those barriers of entry making it as easy as possible to facilitate ben the benefits of the task and this is something i want to look at and talk to you today about it's the idea of changing task structure to accommodate and facilitate learning and control in autism and so the first body of work we're going to talk about in relation to this specifically is some work um, I was involved in prior to coming to Italy when I was in Liverpool working with Spencer, um, where we looked at imitation and imitation learning. So imitation is a, is, has been quite highly, heavily studied in autism because it's a, it's an, it's a very useful bridge between the social elements of like interacting and motor learning as it is in its fundamental terms is observing someone act and copying them. And so this is what we did, but we took out the social element of a human actor and we replaced them with a white dot. So again, it's the same setup, graphics tablet where we're recording their behavior and they're observing stimuli on the screen. And so participants observe this white dot move from left to right on the screen, but they, they, the dot moved differently depending on the condition. So it either moved with a bell-shaped velocity profile. So this is what you're going to see referred to from now on as the typical model. So this is similar to how we would typically move from, from point A to point B. So again, if we look at the light switch move, it makes no sense for us to gradually move to a light switch, then rapidly accelerate towards it at the end. We, we establish, we make that state estimate and we make a simple movement towards it. And this is what this represents. So it's a, they're steadily increasing in velocity to around about 50% of the movement. So this is at 44% of the movement duration and then gradually reducing. 
So this is a, a typical model and you could also refer to it as like a natural movement, a natural model. And then in comparison, we had an atypical model. So again, this moved from left to right on the screen, same amplitude of, the, of 20 centimeters, exactly the same movement time of 1700 milliseconds. But this time it rapidly accelerated and reached peak a higher peak velocity much earlier in the movement. So at 18% of the total duration, and then decreased in velocity as the movement progressed. So it was a very different movement. So on all the trials, what we're going to talk about in these two studies, participants would first observe the movement, and then they would imitate the movement on the graphics tablet. So that would be the basic trial. So just to give you a general idea of what this would look like, these aren't the exact models, but they give you an idea of the differences between the two. So in the typical model, it would just move gradually across the screen at a relatively steady, steady speed compared to the atypical model that would show this rapid acceleration and then a slower, slower on later in the movement. So the first study I want to talk, show to you is one where we use those two models and a third model which um, had constant velocity. So this is a non-biological movement, whereas the other two are being recorded by a human performing these movements on the graphics tablet. This one is computer generated and it is within the same time and distance, but at the exact velocity, the same velocity the whole way through to perform the action. So we have two biological models and then a non-biological non model, but in terms of is relatively similar in terms of its overall characteristics to the typical model, but you can see the difference in the velocities. So what participants did here in a random order, so this is a random order, so trial N would not necessarily equal trial N plus one. They observed one of these models, they copied it, then on the following trial they observe a different model and copy it, and this was done either two targets or without targets, but for this study what we're talking about today, the targets aren't important. What's important is over 40 trials, I think it was 40 trials or 30 trials, 30 trials where they performed these three models equally interspersed. They had on trial N, they might perform the atypical model on trial N plus one, the typical model and so on. So it changed every trial. And so there are two tasks in this thing. One, they had to observe and imitate the movement time of the movements, which was always the same, 1700 milliseconds. So between every trial, this is important, every trial, the timing characteristics was the same. So they could use, the participants can use the timing information from trial N to inform their performance on trial N plus one. But the velocity profile of the movement would change every time. So that would not be helpful as from a trial to trial perspective. So similar to the previous motor learning study we showed, we saw for all models, for, for the atypical and the typical model, we saw changes in timing accuracy for the goal time and time variability. So participants' motor timing was adapting and they were becoming more consistent with practice where they could take advantage of the information from consecutive trials. And this was for both autistic and control participants. But when it came to performing the velocity profile of the movement, the autistic participants had a specific difficulty in performing this atypical movement. So as you'll see for the constant velocity and the typical model, although they might not be exactly at the goal, the goal um, percentage of time where the um, peak velocity occurred, um, the participants were relatively close and performing similarly with, for autism or control. But for this atypical, this unnatural movement, that um, the irrational movement, which isn't how you would typically, you would naturally perform the action, the control participants um, were able to relatively accurately copy that kinematic profile straight away. But regardless how many times they practiced it, the autistic participants weren't able to do so. So if we then think about, okay, Nathan, but you told us earlier that they have problems in motor planning. 
And if they can't use information from trial N to inform trial N plus one, this makes sense. And I would agree. So that is why what we did next was think we thought, okay, so if we know they have problems here, let's create a task structure that we can use to facilitate this process. And so what we did is we removed the constant velocity model and just used the atypical and typical models. And we used blocked practice. So here participants completed a pretest with both models in a random order, like in the previous study, and also a post-test of the same, but in between they completed a blocked acquisition phase. So here they completed 30 consecutive trials of just observing and imitating the atypical model, as well as 30 trials just observing and imitating the typical model, and then these were counterbalanced between participants. So in this next study, we had 20 autistic and 20 neurotypical adults, again, matched on age, gender, and IQ. And as we predicted, and importantly, what we found and replicating the previous study. So here, if we look at this left panel, this is for the atypical model. We have a goal um, percentage time to peak velocity of 18%. And like in the previous study, the neurotypical group, the, the gray diamonds, their performance didn't really change. They were always very accurate, whether in a random condition like in the pretest or during the block practice, they didn't really change. It looks, it appears they were as accurate as they could be. So they reached a kind of a basement effect. But, and then we look at the pretest specifically, the autism participants again in a random condition were significantly less accurate than their neurotypical counterparts for this atypical model. But, Following 30 trials of repetitive blocked practice, where trial N did inform trial N plus one, not only did we see this adaptation in their performance, where they, the autistic participants got better across practice, but we also then showed no difference between the late phase of acquisition and the post-test, and a significant difference between the pre-test and the post-test. So what this showed was that not only could, by structuring the task in this blocked condition, were participants able to learn, the autistic participants were able to learn and improve their accuracy on this imitation task, but that practice facilitated learning in which they could then transfer that from a blocked condition back to a random condition and still be, and be better than they were originally. So this was an effective way to structure a task to facilitate these, this integration of an observed action onto their own motor system to reproduce the action. And for the typical model, as we'd expect, we, like we saw in the previous study, there were no changes in performance. Both groups performed similarly. So this was a really interesting finding. And what it showed us is that whilst we knew that ASD individuals do show difficulties in imitating biological math kinematics, we could facilitate this process and provide a context of a task and a task structure that granted the autistic adults the opportunity to improve on this and facilitate the, the learning and again, be able to transfer that to back to a condition which had been shown to be difficult previously. So when we think about the applications of this, in terms of education and in the classroom, one of the obvious things to think about in terms of imitation is when we talk about demonstrations in lessons and when peer-to-peer -peer -to -peer learning. So if you're in a PE lesson, you're demonstrating a, a skill. So for example, a tennis backhand, and this is gonna be very relevant for people teaching in, in schools where there are both neurotypical and autistic children is that the autistic children would potentially would benefit from that demonstration being repeated several times and then seeing demonstrations again throughout the task as they have a go at it so they can have more opportunity to integrate that absurd information onto their own motor system in comparison to their neurotypical counterparts. But I think it's important to say not all contexts in terms of education or when we perform things are demonstrated to us. We're not always learning through observation, although it is very common and fundamental to development. What about when tasks are self-governed? Because it would be easy to say at this point that 
okay, we know there are motor planning issues in autism. We know that in terms of imitation, especially that if we therefore facilitate those planning motor planning processes during our task structures by using blocked predictable orders, we can help them overcome these problems in terms of the barriers to access. But this isn't always the case. So this is a classical study um, from the 1970s by um, John Shea and Robin Morgan. And they looked at this idea of a contextual interference effect. And what this is, what they did here was they looked at random versus blocked practice on a motor sequence task. So what the participants will have to do is pick up the tennis ball, knock down these gates on the left and right as like certain gates in a certain order to perform a sequence and then return the ball. And there'd be multiple sequences. There were three different sequences they had to practice. Um, so for example, it could have been left front to right middle to left rear. It could have been right front to left middle to right rear, or it could have been right middle to left middle to right rear, for example. So three different unique sequences, but of similar, they were similar in the fact they're all three segments, but they spatially you're going to different places. And so what they did, excuse me, the participants were either assigned to a blocked group or a random group. So the blocked group would practice sequence A, X number of times, then sequence B, X number of times, then sequence C, X number of times. In comparison, the random group practiced all three sequences at the same time interspersed. They'll go A, B, B, C, A, B, et cetera. And what they found here on this, on this left-hand panel, and as you would expect based on what I've just shown you imitation, is that the blocked group during acquisition performed significantly better than the random group, which makes sense. If you know, if you if trial M plus one is the same as the trial you just done, the planning exercise becomes a lot easier. You have it could be easier to do better. Like the random condition makes sense. This high contextual interference condition makes sense as being a harder task. Therefore, your movement times are going to be less accurate. They're not going to be as good. This makes sense. But what they then found in retention, so when they then took away any feedback and delayed the retention later on in time, so here they, they waited 10 minutes and then 10 days, what they found was that the groups who practiced in the random condition, so in this more difficult condition, actually learned better. Their performance in retention on these learned sequences was better than those who practiced in a blot condition, despite the, the opposite being true during practice itself. And so this is very interesting and it shows that the idea of blot practice making planning easier for better learning, as we showed in imitation, isn't a universal truth. It very much depends on what the could very much depend on what the task is. Of course, this is just in neurotypical adults in this study. So what we wanted to do was to examine this in autistic children and see if we can replicate and see if we see the same findings. So what we did is, and this is where, if I don't know if anyone in, from my lab is in the group, but this is where everyone thinks I became obsessed with frogs. So we created a, a game a lab task called Loranus Memorana, so the forgetful frog in Italian, with a bit of a pun on the end. Um, and so what we did is we created a task where we, we made an updated version of that experiment from 1979. And so this is it. This is a basic example of one of my lab members um, completing the task. So participants would see a, a sequence on the screen so you see here, they go down the middle and across, and then they would, as soon as they saw it, as quickly and as accurately as they could, they would perform that sequence of movements by hitting the corresponding targets on a touch screen in front of them. And then we tracked their motor behavior using a Vicon motion capture system. And so what we did was we had three practice sequences and the participants 
performed 45 trials, so 15 per sequence in practice in either the blocked, the low contextual interference or the high contextual interference condition, followed that by retention tests and transfer tests. So this is where it's a bit different. So the retention tests, whilst participants only completed one of the acquisition conditions, they completed both retention tests. So they learn sequences A, B, and C, and then they even either a blocked or random order, and then they completed a blocked retention test and a random retention test. So either five of the one, five of the other, or interspersed, and then two transfer tests. So the transfer tests were slightly different. Here, participants were asked to perform new novel sequences. So we had a free segment transfer test where participants performed sequence D and a four segment transfer test where participants performed sequence E. So the important thing here when it comes to these new sequences is that sequence D has the exact same total amplitude and number of segments as A, B and C. So its complexity is the same and equivalent to the learned sequences. Whereas sequence E is longer, it has four segments, the total distance they have to move is further. So we had in total somehow, and I really have to give a big thank you to, um, to, my, to our lab members, Katrina and Sweeney and the Bella Peretti um, for helping with this. Somehow last year, we managed to get 60 children through the lab, 30 ASD and 30 TD, and they were assigned randomly to either the high CI or low CI condition. And then these groups were matched for age, gender, and IQ. Um, we also recorded some other measures and I've put the raw scores for the MABC2 here for you. Um, so we didn't use MABC as a matching criteria. They completed, in most cases, they completed this after they'd completed the experiment. Um, but what we found was when we look at the raw scores is the there was a significant difference in motor ability between the ASD and TD participants across manual dexterity, ball skills, and the balance and equilibrium tasks. But there were no differences within population. So the ASD high CI and the ASD low CI groups, there were no significant differences within, but between ASD and TD, there was a significant difference. So we have to look at these next findings with that in mind, because it becomes quite interesting. So what we looked at here in terms of dependent variables were reaction time. So this was the time from when the stimulus appeared on the screen to when the participant first began moving. Movement time, the time from movement onset to the end of the movement and total time, which is the sum of both reaction time and movement time. So reaction time is the one where we're looking at, and we, we would suggest is indicative of the motor planning. And then the movement time is the motor execution in a simple term. So if we break this down into our three test phases in acquisition, we found this um, condition effect and a, and a learning effect. So all three groups, all both conditions across all four groups, everyone learned and got better at performing the actions. And we saw this in terms of motor planning, we saw the advantage of the height of the low CI, the blocked condition as we expected. Um, but, and as we also expected, we saw a significant effect of diagnosis. So the, in general, the autistic participants reaction times were slower than their neurotypical counterparts. But then in the retention tests, this diagnosis effect was still present, but the condition effect wasn't there. So what we found in terms of planning in reaction time was regard, there was no advantage or no clear advantage of performing, having learned under a high or a low CI um, task structure. So this wasn't what we we're expecting and hoping for. We were hoping to replicate the previous findings or find potentially the opposite in autism based on the imitation work. But no, we found there was we, with no clear advantages from this analysis 
of those task structures. And the same was true for the transfer tasks. Again, the autistic participants were generally slower in their reaction time and were more greatly affected by the change in complexity, but there was no advantage of high or low CI. And then the same was true in movement time. Again, we saw, apart from here, we didn't see in movement time and acquisition, we did not see the advantage of blocked, but we again, we showed slower times in autism in terms of motor execution, which has previously been suggested and shown, and I know Cheryl spoke about last week, and we saw these learning effects. And then our retention tests and our transfer tests followed the same pattern as before where we weren't seeing these advantages of the high, high contextual interference learning condition that we expected. And then total time replicates the same again. Um, again, we saw learning, we saw an advantage of block practice, which based on the fact this effect wasn't present in, um, in the uh, movement time variable, but is in reaction time and total time, does suggest that this is a function of that the um, CI effect is affecting the planning processes. Um, but again, we don't see this advantage of condition in retention or transfer. But what we do see, and this was a present in all three, but I'll talk about it now, is we see these test by condition interactions. Um, so what this is suggesting and what it was, was it suggests that the those who learned in the low CI condition performed better in the blocked retention test in comparison to the random retention test. Um, so what this is suggesting is that and seems to suggest is that the those who learn in a blocked in the predictable blocked low CI learning condition found it harder to transfer out of that kind of predictable structure. So they found it harder to then perform the form the sequences in a random order where they didn't know what they were going to do next. And this is quite interesting, especially I think in terms of the classroom, which are unpredictable environments and in group tasks, but also in terms of when we think about social interactions in autism. If I interact with one person and I get they're not necessarily going to react to and use the same body language and the social interaction isn't going to be the same as when I talk to the next person. Social interactions by their nature are random and variable. So whilst we saw the expected results in terms of autistic children being generally slow in terms of reaction time and movement time, and we saw this advantage of the blocked condition during acquisition, there seems to be more going on in the to do with the retention test than these variables are showing. And so this is also true in the original study. So they looked at this as a between subject factor as we've looked at it within. But during their retention tests, they changed the task structure to either blocked or random. So you have the, the black circles with the dash line did a blocked acquisition to block test phase. The um, white circles with the solid line went random to random, and then black with a solid line went blocked to random and white random to blocked. And they showed the same thing that we're suggesting from this test by condition analysis is that the group that specifically suffered in the retention tests were those that learned under a blocked low contextual interference condition and then were tested in the random condition. So it seems that this learning did not provide them necessarily the flexibility or like the experience to be able to elaborate on these on these motor plans and expand them to this random condition. And when we looked at like a very basic plot, so here for each panel, so we have reaction time, movement time, total time, ASD and neurotypical. Um, so here we're looking at, I'm just looking at, want to look at just what is actually happening in terms of performance between these two phases. So we have, late nine, which is, so this is the final five trials of acquisition. And then we have the first five trials of the block test and the random test for each of these variables. And the black lines represent the high contextual interference participants and the red lines, the low 
And just by eyeballing this, there seems to be a pattern where the black lines are more horizontal and the red lines seem to go up from left to right, which is suggest in not in every case, there's a quite a bit of variability here, but there seems to be a pattern that the those in the high CI condition are maintaining their performance from practice, from acquisition to testing more than those who learned in the low CI condition, which was, wasn't necessarily clear from our initial analyses. So we decided to look, look at this in more detail. So we use this retention transfer index. So this is exactly what I've just shown you in those figures. It is the last five trials, the performance on the last five trials subtracted by their performance in the first five trials of each relevant test. So this gives us an index variable of behavior change of performance change over time for these conditions. And so here on these, on the last one I'm about to show you, a score of zero or a positive, it would be a maintenance, maintenance of performance. So if I moved at in 1500 milliseconds in point A and 1500 at point B, I'd get zero, I'd be performing exactly the same. A positive score here will show an, actually an improvement in performance. So they're going faster and a negative score will show a reduction in performance. So when we look at just reaction time and movement time, total time effects were the same, but for brevity, I'll just show these two. For the retention tests, so we have here our four groups, and then the blue bars are the block test and the orange bars are the random test. We start to see this advantage of learning under a high contextual interference condition, independent importantly, independent of, of diagnosis. So this the same pattern and the same effect occurred in both the autistic and neurotypical children. And what we found was that those who learned under a high contextual interference effect, um, condition, sorry, maintained their performance better from practice into the two retention tests compared to those who performed under a low, learned under a low condition and we also start to see this specific problem in terms of being those who learned under a block test really struggled in the random test in comparison. So they didn't, they didn't have that ability to transfer from between environments, between contexts in comparison to the, those who learned under the more difficult high CI condition. And then we look at the, the first transfer test, we saw the same for the planning for the reaction time. Again, we saw in terms of planning for that novel sequence they never had to perform before, participants in the high CI conditions, regardless of whether they were autistic or not, were much better able to transfer what they learned to this new context and new sequence than those who learned under a low CI condition although there were no effects on movement times. So this was specifically related to planning here. But for the more complex task, this wasn't the case. We didn't see any advantage in terms of transferring to the more complex task. And what we did show actually was here, especially in terms of planning, um, like we saw in the movement time, reaction time measures, is that the those with autism were more greatly affected and impacted by the difficulty change of the task, um, which I think is it could be informative itself in terms of in education when you are uh, differentiation of work and like advancing across um, ability levels, etc. But this is quite interesting. We did see those effects that we expected when we looked at those indexes, but it wasn't there in the in the traditional measure of movement time, reaction time. So our next task for that study is going to be to look at this subject variability, as you saw on those red and black lines, it, there was no clear, like concrete, crystal clear pattern. And also in terms of tailoring um, interventions based on this, we want to see, uh, investigate whether there are any individual differences in our participants that may, could be used as an indicator of whether a certain structure may be appropriate or another. But overall, I think the take home of this, of especially that last study, is that 
you can make a task seem more difficult. That's what, because that eff effectively is what the random order is doing. You're increasing the difficulty of acquisition. But by doing that, you can see these benefits for learning and transfer of newly acquired motor skills. And this is the case in both autism and the neurotypical children. But and like I said, for the imitation work, this isn't a universal truth. The use of these practice structures may not be appropriate for all contexts. And when we think of the classroom, there are times we're watching demonstrations, there are times we're working in groups, there are times when we're working independently on our own. And maybe it's across these contexts is where, in the case of autism, we need to vary the task structures specifically. So when we're working on our own in a self-paced, self-governed task, the children can benefit from those random structures. But when we come to block structures, specifically for autism, those block we need when we go into group tasks where there's opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer learning, we're observing demonstrations um, from the teacher or from our peers. Um, repetitive block structures are, could be more advantageous because it gives the autistic children the opportunity to have more increased exposure and the opportunity to integrate what they're observing and map it onto their own motor system. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all my collaborators on these projects and our funding from the European Union and thank you all for your attention over the last 45 minutes or so. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, I might uh, start off with a few questions, if that's OK. Um, it's quite interesting, isn't it, when you when you think about the autism literature right now in, in terms of um, motor behaviour or motor skills, um, there's a lot of energy looking towards diagnosis. And you, you mentioned that previously um, in terms of diagnosing um, autism earlier uh, than it's typically diagnosed now at about three and a half through the social yeah. uh, process. So obviously the, the basis of your work then is tailoring towards these kind of um, individual um, practice-based interventions for, for school children, which is quite interesting. Um, would you mind commenting please um, on, the, on the CI effect? Because what's actually very interesting about that contextual interference effect, and it's been around the literature since the 1970s, if not a bit before in the 1960s, is that there are specific processes that are engaged during that action, which are which I think are really um, uh, importantly linked to teaching. Could you comment on what sort of process you think are happening and why that's important for encouraging learning and transfer? Yeah. So what? There's a couple of school of thoughts in what exactly is going on for the CI effect. And I couldn't tell you, I couldn't, especially from this study, I couldn't tell you for sure which is going on. So one is um, this kind of, kind of recall hypothesis where participants, children take part in these tasks. You are kind of forgetting what you did previously then remembering it quickly. So you become more effective at recalling that information yeah. And then the other idea is that you become, because you're having to adapt all the time, you become better at elaborating on the plans that you have created and the models you have processed previously. So you become better at expanding what you know to a new context, yeah. to a new task. Um, so yeah, so while we talked about these in terms of motor abilities, um, but I think it just, these are, cognitive processes are so fundamentally just associated with learning yeah um so we're discussing it here in this motor context but that doesn't mean it wouldn't necessarily it wouldn't work in terms of attainment of maths like math skills etc because like that's kind of the same it's the same cognitive process and in terms of like motor learning and when we look at like the feedback in some of those studies yeah where you are you're learning the, the, the like the mechanism being used to encourage learning is this knowledge of results feedback where you're telling yeah. someone you went x milliseconds too slow x milliseconds faster yeah that is a equation based process like you're yeah. it's the same cognitive skills as doing subtraction doing addition 
So it's engaging those same processes. So it's, I think that's where the key is in terms of when it's why it facilitates this transfer across contexts yeah. and why we see this, this specific, what we saw originally in this study where the blocked, the, the low CI condition specifically was struggling in the random test, but not the block test because they weren't able to elaborate and recall these processes quickly enough in yeah. that new context in comparison to those that had been exposed to it before. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and obviously from your from your data and your results, then you know I I, th- I think it's it's no it's not easy to do the type of study that you did in Italy that CI study and and what you get out of that study is um, what looks relatively complex in terms of your figures. But what's um, um, you and I have spoken about this for a, a period of time now, and in lots of schools that we work with in in, in London and, and Liverpool are really interested in movement because it has these cascade effects onto physical activity and fundamental movement skills, which has benefits on on physical and, and mental health, and that's really really important. Um, how have you found um, when you've delivered this message to other people in terms of you know their you know the the understanding of these kind of motor behavior principles in in teaching of motor skills um so yes yeah, so my experience has been relatively the same that the um people are very aware of the motor element now yeah and especially in terms of like dcd the, like whether dcd is when people talk about DCD and autism, like in terms of like co-occurrence, whether it is DCD or it's the same, isn't necessarily clear, but yeah, the, the benefits of the, of motor interventions so the fundamental motor skills are clear. And I think that is something every, from the clinicians I've spoken to, they're aware of and are very encouraging of. Yeah. Um, but what was interesting, I would say is so the, discussions with clinicians that I worked with here is that the the message of what I'm talking about here in terms of like random practice they felt it came across very counterintuitive yeah and we, hence the title of practice make perfect or make practice perfect yeah it's not necessarily trickled down to inform practice in the same way you would have seen, you saw these messages come out in the like the motor control, motor behavior literature in the 70s and 80s, and then it went into sport, for, for example, because it's, the, it's the obvious transfer of it. Yeah. And, and we saw the up, the uptake was very quick in terms of, and you'll see all the studies, if you look at the CI effect, for example, I'm not sure how many times it's been cited now, but you'll find hundreds of papers on different physical skills in terms of sports performance. Yeah. Um, but in terms of then seeing how that benefits these other aspects that might engage the same cognitive processes, the work isn't necessarily, yeah. the evidence isn't necessarily there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and your work on imitation as well. So historically in the autism literature, then you, you could you could do any kind of search going back 50, 60 years. And, you'd, and there's lots of suggestions that there are um, differences in the efficacy of imitation. And that's linked to biological motion processing and, and neural differences in, in certain aspects of the cortex. Um, and that's pervasive in the literature, actually. And I think, I think that study that um, you published is one of the first studies that actually to show imitation learning. And, it, and the, the challenge now then is to try and adapt that and link that to, into applications. And that's, that's where I think it's, it's, it's actually really quite important is to, is to make that transition. I know that's something that you're, you're trying to do. Um, but yeah, but, but thank you. I am mindful of time and it's also half term. So thank you very much for your time. And um, I know that you guys are doing a great job in Italy on your work and that CI study looks uh, amazing. So well done on that. Cheers, um, thank you. Have a nice evening. And um, uh, we'll chat again, obviously. But again, thank you very much for your time. And for those uh, that listened, again, thank you for your time. Next week, we have Professor Michael Thomas and uh, Joe van der Hagen, uh, who are my colleagues here in, in London, and they'll be talking next week on neuromyths, actually. So uh, we'll see you next week, and, and thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Thanks, everyone.